And now up, um, we're going to actually look at supply chain um, use cases, provenance, trade and uh, tracking and tracing. And we've got a great lineup, a lineup of three. We've got Gert um, Silvest, who's the co-founder of the highly successful Trade Shift uh, platform. We've got Pedro Lopez Belmont, uh, blockchain and solution architect uh, at Richemont, um, which owns some of the most, well, best known luxury brands like Cartier and Jaeger Le Coutre and uh, Mont Blanc. And then we've got uh, Guido uh, Molinari, who's a managing partner at Prism Group. So we are very well um, honored to have you all here. Thanks. Can you hear us. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, we're going to kick off with Gert. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Trade Shift. It's a very popular and um, successful um, company, uh, and it's taken you maybe a little bit of time to um, actually work on blockchain. Um, is that true? How long have you guys been in the blockchain space? And what are you looking at right now? What excites you the most? Yeah, so um, so we've been in the blockchain space for, for the past two and a half years. So it's not where we started. We founded the company in 2010. Um, and, and what we set out to do is, is to see if we could create a platform that could connect uh, every company in the world, uh, but in order to create economic opportunity for, for the participant. And it was based off the observation that in the B2B space, there's very, very little digitization. I mean, we all exchange emails and PDFs, but when it comes to the actual hardcore transactions underlying modern business, it's, it's more than 90% that is not uh, digital. Um, and, and our big hypothesis around this is it's basically based on how, how do we in incentivize uh, participants to digitize. And we know it from our private lives that we get you know, free, free, free access to services. Um, and that has inter incentivized people to join um, uh, social networks in, in the billions. And that's also how we look at it. So, so when we look at the blockchain space, uh, you know, one of the key challenges we see in supply chains is the lack of access to credit, uh, the lack of uh, predictable working capital. And, and I think a crisis mm -hmm. like the COVID crisis just underlines that even more. We saw in the last financial crisis, that um, the fact that, that that big enterprises are suddenly holding back on spending has ripple effects down the supply chain because uh, because uh, the cash flow becomes uh, increasingly more unpredictable. And so on the one hand, you, you do have digital transactions, but you have a very hard time getting access to funding. And, and, and we believe this is because you don't consider this collaboration uh, a kind of digital asset. And that's uh, the space that we see a blockchain opening up for. That's uh, the opportunity to treat this as digital asset and, and actually couple, uh, uh, if you could couple the, the actual settlement with the transaction, for example, invoices and purchase orders, you suddenly have uh, a, a very interesting uh, class of investment objects that today are not very, um, very uh, have a very high liquidity. Uh, but with blockchain, we, we, we can see that uh, that that changing. Absolutely, I um I completely agree with you. I think it's one of the most compelling use cases. And another very compelling use case is around provenance and uh, mitigation of counterfeiting and fraud. So I'd like to turn this next question to Pedro regarding uh, provenance and tracking and tracing. Um, we talked a lot about sustainability and supply chains, but could you talk a little bit about what is Richemont doing? What kind of problems do you find um, blockchain could help potentially solve? Well, uh, as you mentioned, the biggest uh, or the the first problem we are tackling is the the, the counterfeit uh, issue. Um, not only uh, in in terms of uh, luxury, this is a very big uh, the very big problem. Uh, along with some others, uh, grey market, uh, etc. And uh, with uh, when we started the blockchain journey, we wanted to uh, to understand if the technology uh, was able to help us. So it was not uh, about the technology, but uh, about the potential it had to to help us uh, on this. Uh, on these issues and uh, last year we uh, successfully started two projects uh, the most uh, well known is uh, 
uh, with Vacheron Constantin, is uh, one of our brands. And uh, we did it in collaboration with a startup called uh, Ariani. Uh, and it's just about providing a digital certificate for our watches, right? Instead of, uh, we are replacing the traditional paper certificate with right. a digital one, which has a lot of um, advantages, uh, not only the, the replacing the, the paper itself with something which is more permanent, but coupling it with blockchain technology, uh, we can uh, certify the provenance of the, of the watch, uh, we can certify the, the ownership, and we enhance, uh, we, we enable enhanced services such as transfer of the ownership uh, or tracking of the different activities, for example, that we can do over the watch, like uh, repairs, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, and we foresee some uh, things in the future. So this is uh, very interesting because uh, we started this in the, in the blockchain hype. Uh, today, this hype, as some of the speakers uh, uh, have mentioned already, is gone. And in our case, uh, our trend is uh, going up. Is uh, and, and this is basically um, because uh, blockchain technology, beyond the marketing uh, power that was having uh, in in the short past, uh, is having real power to solve uh, problems and to be more efficient. And uh, in that sense, uh, as I mentioned. For counterfeiting, we are still we still have a long way to go uh, mm -hmm. because uh, one of the key problems now is the link between the digital asset uh, and the physical object, uh, which um, uh, is, is uh, at least in our case is not possible to have a, a hundred percent uh, guarantee of uh, of that link. But we are in the process of closing uh, the gap. We are taking steps some of them are baby steps some other are a bit more uh, a bit bigger but we are taking these steps in order to close the gap and, and really provide a solution that first and foremost give value to our customers because at the end of the day uh, our customers is what uh, gives also value to us absolutely I'll, I'll jump in i'll jump in here i'll bring guido in here uh because i think that's a really interesting point that pedro made about this uh you know the, this, this hype cycle thing that we hear all about but you know things like supply chain and the provenance these, these use cases are quite well explored i just wondered guido wh where else are you seeing consortia efforts still cropping up in the blockchain space or you know has it has that gone a bit quiet or is it still uh happening Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah, actually, we are seeing definitely a shift in terms of the industries where you're seeing new uh, consortium efforts. Um, I would say one of the areas where um, many of our clients are now very active, again, no big announcement that we made yet, i wait for later in the year, it's going to be taxation. And there is where we're seeing not only, of course, large enterprises, big core accounting firms, but also national governments that are, you know, in a period of crisis, more and more interested in making sure that they receive the tax revenue that they should be receiving, right? And so transparency in taxation is something where we're seeing a lot of efforts in terms of, you know, both companies and governments creating, creating consortia. Um, there are, of course, other networks where you have seen the deployment of the consortia, and now you're seeing a buildup of additional use cases to bring, you know, a path to monetization for the efforts. So often what we've noticed with clients is that initially putting down the rails between the members, it's not a particularly ROI improving effort for the participants. But once you have those rails in place, then you can build up um, you know, different business use, use cases and it's very easy to implement, right? Really almost with the click of a button and you can deploy other products uh, that are immediately available to all members and then uh, you know you get the network effect from you know the use case right away which is something that which is you know very hard if you had to each time rebuild a new network. Um, We're working with the big the big four sort of thing on this tax business can you say? I cannot mention which of the big four but um, but but yeah a couple of big four are working on, on taxation networks at, at the moment um, again, I think in a period of crisis, use cases where there's going to be a very direct revenue for many of the participants, whether it's tax relief, you know, from the investor end or 
um, the actual um, tax collection from the from the tax authority. These are going to be very attractive use cases. Uh, other use cases where you know uh, the monetization path is much longer. Um, we've seen you know they're being put a bit on the back burner. Uh, and of course, it depends also on the industry, right? Uh, certain industries, for example, you know, we've done a lot of work in healthcare and pharmaceutical. Now the focus has been shifted more on responsiveness to to the COVID crisis, and so um, you know, certain projects have been put on on hold for for the moment. Sure, sure. I just want to jump over to to Garrett really quickly and and just say, hey, I was really impressed by the work you're doing with uh, the the government of Denmark uh, to try and do some COVID relief deep inside the supply chains, which I 